Good evening, friends. It's Sunday evening. Thanks for tuning in to our online service only, uh, where my family and I are unable to be here tonight, so we've recorded this service for you. I'm going to try to share a message in song with you. Uh, it's a, a familiar tune, and some of the words are familiar and some of them are new, but it's been a blessing to me, and I'm going to try to share that with, uh, with you tonight, and I hope that will be a blessing to you. And then after that, we're going to get into our study of the book of Acts, the church continues. So if you want to get your Bible out, find Acts chapter 5, and uh, after the song, we'll get right into that. Friends, it's Sunday evening, August the 16th. If you are tuning in tonight, uh, this is actually a pre recorded message. I, I sat down here, I was going to sit under a fan, but the fan was too noisy for the recording. But it was just easier to stay here than uh, to switch everything else. And uh, so we're just going to stay here tonight and have a little Bible study. And I hope that uh, it will be a blessing to you. We're in our church services these that past number of Sundays, we're studying the book of Acts. And uh, we're talking about the church continues. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, was the foundation of the church uh, and his disciples. And it continued into the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament and up to today during the church age. So we're just studying through the book of Acts and learning some uh, very important truths from the book of Acts. So I'd ask you tonight to take your Bible, if you have one close to you, or maybe you have a device with a Bible app on it, and open it up to... Uh, the book of Acts in your New Testament, Acts chapter 5. I hope you can read what's on the screen there. It may be a little small for you, uh, 
uh, later, but uh, hopefully you can at least uh, see a little bit of it that it will help you tonight just to follow along. We're not going to be a long time, it'll be 10 or 15 minutes uh, just studying. A, for some it's a familiar story, maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, uh, but we're going to talk about a couple tonight, uh, a husband and a wife, doing the right thing the wrong way. Uh, some people have the idea that it doesn't matter how you do it as long as it gets done. It doesn't matter if you do it right way or wrong way, the, the, the end justifies the means sometimes is uh, how people phrase it. Uh, but it's very important that we do things the right way. God is more concerned with our heart attitude uh, really than our actions. There's a story in 2 Samuel about David bringing back the Ark of the Covenant and they were told to carry it, uh, the Levites were to carry it. And uh, in this occasion, uh, David and his men decided they would put it on a cart and tow it back. And one man reached out when the, the cart shook when it hit a bump and the ark shook that was on the cart. And the man reached out his hand to steady it and God struck him dead. And uh, that uh, seems a bit drastic, but God was showing to those people he was very serious about how he wanted things done. That They had to be done the right way with the right heart attitude. Uh, they were doing a good thing. They were bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. And, but we have to go, uh, when we want to do the right thing, we can't go about it the wrong way. We also have to do it the right way. So I'm going to uh, read for you a story from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 5, and then we'll look at a few thoughts from it. But let's pray together first and ask the Lord to help us in our understanding this evening. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity uh, we have now to sit around your word. I thank you for technology that makes this uh, possible for us as I sit here and, and record this so that we can uh, show this on Sunday evening for people to watch. And Lord, I pray that you would use uh, these few moments together around your word to help us in our Christian life. You'd strengthen our faith, strengthen our walk, and that we would be better examples of you and better ambassadors for you in our world. Help us, Lord, now in these few moments to hear what the scriptures have to say. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and uh, carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. No doubt great fear came upon them. What a, a, I mean, a drastic story to tell, uh, an, an event to happen that would impact so many people. But the lesson is there for us to learn to do God's work God's way. Do the right thing the right way, not the wrong way. Now, just a few thoughts I want you to consider with me tonight, if you would. And the first one I want you to think about with me is that generosity was exemplified. We're actually going to go back into chapter 4 to look at these verses. Actually, this morning, in our Sunday morning service, we looked at the man Barnabas. And uh, if we looked at him through the book of Acts and what the Bible tells us about him, just encouraging us to act like Barnabas. But there's some interesting thoughts here about the generosity that was showed amongst this early church. Look in chapter 4 in your Bibles, if you would, verse 32 of Acts, chapter 4, verse 32. 
The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. They had all things common. First of all, the charity of Christianity. These Christians, when they saw that others had needs, they sold their possessions and gave to the people that had a need. The Bible tells us we can have faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of those is charity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14 says, Let all your things be done with charity. 1 Peter 4 8, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. And the Bible says here that uh, these early Christians said, You know what? The things that I have, they're not just mine. God gave them to me to be a steward of, and I'm going to use them to bless other people. So they showed the charity of Christianity. They were like Jesus Christ. I want you to see, secondly, the grace of giving. Verse 33 of chapter 4. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Grace is giving us what we do not deserve. And God gave these apostles great grace to go out and preach the gospel to these uh, people of their communities that needed to hear about Jesus. And the Bible here tells us that they gave of themselves and they gave of their possessions. Paul writes to uh, the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 how that they gave to their power and beyond their power. And the Bible says that they did that through the grace of God. And God allows us to give when he gives us his grace to be able to give to meet the needs of others, and God will take care of his own. Back in Acts chapter 4 and verse 34, it says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Would you think about with me now the proffering of provisions? The Bible says they didn't think that they what they had that if they didn't need it they sold it and gave it to others none of them were lacking they proffered their provisions they proffered their possessions they weren't required to do this and it wasn't really a what we've considered a communal lifestyle where everybody just brought everything and, and they it was a community that gave what they had to meet the needs of others Acts 2 and verse 45, just a couple pages earlier in the Bible, says they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. There must have been some people among them that had needs. And these early Christians said, I am going to give what I can to meet the needs of others. And then we see the nullifying of the need. Verse 35 it laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distri distribution was made to every man according as he had need. So everyone that had a need, the apostles were able to meet that need because Christians, by the grace of God, were able to sacrifice of their own possessions, sell them, take that money, give it to the apostles, and they were able to meet the needs of others. Their needs were nullified. God does that for his children. In Philippians 4 and verse 19, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. God takes care of our needs. He doesn't always give us everything we want, which is probably a good thing. Just like parents don't always give their children everything they want, but they do take care of their needs. And God takes care of our needs. God takes care of the needs of his children. Psalm 37, the psalmist said, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 34 and verse 10 says, They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing, because God takes care of his, the needs of his children. And we see the sacrifice of the Son of Consolation. We talked about him this morning in verse 36. I forgot to put it on the screen for you, so you, you'll have to add that one if you're taking notes. The sacrifice of the Son of Consolation. Verse 36 talks about Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. He was a Levite that uh, could not own land in Israel according to the law. The Levites uh, were probably, uh, the Levites were not allowed to own land as part of God's servants, but 
he had a Levite, and he was of the he was a Levite, sorry, and he was of the country of Cyprus. So not being allowed to own land in Israel as a Levite, he probably the only thing he had was a piece of property in Cyprus where he was from. And he sold that land, the Bible says in verse 37, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The only thing that he probably owned was a piece of property, not even in Israel. And he sold that and gave it uh, so that the disciples could use that to meet the needs of others. That was a great sacrifice for him, but he was willing to do that because God had given him grace. And the generosity of the early Christians was exemplified in this area of selling what they could to help meet the needs of others. But I want you to think with me now about this thought. There was greed that was exercised. We read in Acts chapter 5, uh, the first couple of verses about Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They had a possession, the Bible says, and they sold it. They wanted to help someone else, but they had a selfish desire. They had a selfish desire. The Bible tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, many people quote that verse and they say money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. It says the love of money. Many people who don't have a lot of money get themselves into a lot of trouble because they love money, not because they have a lot of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And these people had a, a desire a selfish desire for profit. They wanted to profit from the sale of their land. It says they had a piece of, uh, they said they sold a possession and they kept back part of the price. There was no problem with them selling their, their possession. The problem came was that they did not want anybody to know that they profited from it. They said, we want people to think that we have given everything we have gotten from this sale to meet the needs of others. And they had a selfish desire for pride. They wanted people to think highly of them. They wanted people to think that they were great sacrificial Christians like Barnabas and the others. And they were pretentious. <laughs> they were pretending to be more spiritual than they were. They were pretending that they were great sacrificing Christians to give to the needs of others as they sold a possession. They said, we're going to keep back part, but we're going to tell them the money that we give them is the entire amount of money we got. So they'll think we're sacrificial, yet we'll profit from it. Not only did they have a selfish desire, but there was some self-deceit. The Bible says they kept back in verse number two, part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. His wife knew what was, was going on. Ananias and Sapphira came to agreement. They said, let's sell this possession for this amount of money, whatever we can get, but we'll take this much money and give it to the disciples and we'll tell them that's how much we got for it. They don't need to know that we're getting a little bit from it. And the only people they deceived were themselves because God knew what was going on. And, and God told Peter and, and the disciples, and sometimes, you know, we can deceive others and sometimes we can even deceive ourselves but God can never be deceived be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap they deceived themselves they were privy to it they they came up with this plan they said we're not letting anyone else know uh, and they were just deceiving themselves when they came to see Peter Satan's devices were shown verse 3 Peter said Ananias why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Satan's devices, he's controlling. Satan wants to control our life. He wants to control it with temptations. He wants to control it with our weaknesses, with our failings that we have. He wants to make us think that we cannot control our own life and he is, only the, really one, is really the only one who can. He wants you to think that you cannot help the sin that you have committed. Every man is tempted, the Bible says in James 1 and verse 14, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Satan's devices, he's controlling. He says, why have you let him fill you? Why have you let him control you in this area? He's also conniving. The Bible says, why has he filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? 
You know, Satan hasn't changed his tactics. He lied to Eve in the garden. He lied to Ananias and Sapphira to get them to lie to Peter, trying to lie to the Holy Ghost. And he tries to get us to lie, even to ourselves. Satan's devices are controlling us. He's conniving. And there's some contempt. It says, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Satan showed complete contempt for God. And Satan knew God would find out about this. God knows everything. But Satan showed contempt right from the beginning. When Satan said in Isaiah chapter 14, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, is what Satan said. Because he shows contempt for God. And when he lies to us and when he tries to get us to lie to ourselves or lie to others and he wants us to ignore biblical principles and truths, get us to live for ourselves, Satan is showing contempt for God and he wants us to show contempt for God. The early Christians here in the church were showing great generosity, but this couple was showing great greed. But now we see that their guilt was exposed. In verse 8, the Bible tells us they premeditated on a proper price. They came in, Ananias came in, sorry, first. And before he even says anything, he laid down this money and says, This is all the money I got for my sale of my possession. And Peter said, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? When it was yours, in verse number four, when you first got that money, it was yours to do with whatever you wished. After you sold the possession, the, the money you had, it was in your power. So why did you conceive this thing? Why didn't you just say, hey, we can't give all of this because we need some of it. But here is what we don't need. We can live without this, so take this much. He said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. In verse 5, when Ananias heard this, God took his life. God took his life for lying to the Holy Ghost. And the young men carried him out. In verse number 7, about three hours later, his wife appears on the scene. And Peter says, did you sell the money for, sell the, your uh, land for this much money? And she said, yes, we did. And Peter said, why did you agree why did you premeditate to lie and sin against God? They decided beforehand, we're going to give this much money and we're going to say that's all the money we have. They decided how much they wanted to keep. They decided how much to say was left and that was the entire price. And they didn't fall into sin. They made a choice with their eyes open and their mind made up. And we need to be careful that we don't premeditate on the sin and try to find a way to get past it, and then to presume upon God's goodness. Peter said in verse 9 of Acts chapter 5, Peter said, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord God? And then Sapphira falls down dead, and the same young man that carried out her husband carried her out. He said, Why did you tempt God, why did you presume upon his goodness? You know, there's a saying, I'm sure you've heard it, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Um, that's not an excuse to just go and do wrong. That's not an excuse to say, well, I'm going to sin, but God will forgive me. I'll talk to God later and we'll get it all squared away. That's not how the Christian life should work. Yes, God will forgive. But when we tempt God, we, we see how far we can go to presume upon his goodness. The Israelites did that over and over as they wandered through the wilderness, as they complained about this and they complained about that. And they tempted God. He used that phrase in Psalm 95, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work. He said, they tempted me in the garden. And Jesus Christ himself said to Satan in Matthew 4, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We shouldn't tempt God uh, and see how far we can push his grace and his goodness. And there was a prediction of conduct's consequences. Peter said, The feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Sin always has 
consequences. God told Adam and Eve in the garden, when you eat of the tree, in the day you eat thereof, you shall die. And they did die. They didn't fall over dead physically, but they died spiritually. Their relationship with God ended on that day. God said, get out of the garden, and I can't come meet with you anymore in the cool of the day. As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Romans 5 and verse 12. And I'm sure you've heard Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. That's the price. That's the penalty. James 1 and 15, verse 15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There is physical death on this earth today because of sin. There is spiritual death because of sin. There is relationship death because of sin. Families have been broken apart. Relationships have died. Ministry opportunities have died because people have sinned. Sin always brings consequences. The wages of sin is death. You can say, Pastor Sanford, that's not a very encouraging message tonight. Well, you can be encouraged if you think about it this way with me. The Bible says in Galatians 6 and verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So it's all in how we live. It's exemplifying generosity. We display Christian charity by the grace of giving. We display the love of Christ when we give. For God so loved the world that he gave. So if we want to be like Jesus Christ, we need to give. Give whatever we can. And we don't need to lie about it. If we only have a little bit to give, let's give the little bit and be honest and say, Lord, I've only got this much, but I'll give it out of a heart of love. And Lord, if you can use it, great. Let's expel greed. We shouldn't be greedy for profit or pride. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, like the, the Pharisees would ring a bell when they came to the temple to worship. They'd ring a bell so people would see them drop a large offering. This life is not about us. This life is about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to magnify him by being selfless. We don't need to draw attention to ourselves. Let's draw attention to the Lord. So we exemplify generosity, expel greed, and expose guilt. If we find ourselves premeditating on sin, that we say, well, there's a temptation here before me, and I'd like to go do that. I, I, I want to do this, but I don't want anyone to find out. And I know God knows everything, but God will forgive me, and I'll talk to him later. So we, if we find ourselves premeditating, how can I do this and get away with it so no one else finds out? We need to stop right there and expose it to the Lord and say, Lord, here, I, I'm struggling with this. I, I want to sin. And I'm making up my mind to sin. Please forgive me. Help me. Give me another thing to do. Give me uh, strength to stay away from that. Confess it for what it is, and you'll grow in your relationship with the Lord. You know, doing things the right way is just as important as doing the right thing. These people were doing a good thing. If they had to come and said, listen, we sold a piece of land for this much money, but we can't give it all because we need some to pay our bills, but we'll give this much. God would have been pleased with that. God doesn't care how much they were giving. God wanted them to do it with the right heart attitude to please God. So when we go to do the right thing or, or we want to give, we want to be generous or whatever, let's not say, well, I just want people to see it and be, think I'm a great Christian. Let's say, I want God to think highly of me. I want God to be pleased with my actions. So as we go about doing the right things, let's do them the right way. And that we're going to look at the rest of this chapter probably next Sunday morning and see that when we do things God's way, we'll never lack God's supply. I hope that was a help to you tonight. Thank you for taking time uh, to listen to this message. And uh, we're going to be here this, Lord willing, this Wednesday with a youth hour at 6 o'clock and our Bible study at 7. And our Bible study tonight, we've spent the last, or Wednesday night, the last two Wednesdays, we've looked at what angels are did in the Bible and are they still doing it? We answered that question and this Wednesday night we're going to ask the question, do people become angels when they die? So if you think that's going to be interesting to you, tune in uh, this Wednesday night at 7 or you can meet us here at church. We'll have a great service. Thank you so much.
God bless you. I hope you have a great evening.